news and she's back by popular demand. Dr. Rachel L. Ross, MD, is back with me. Welcome once again Ross, to the show, you. my friend. Always a pleasure. Outstanding. You know, first of all, I'm going to do one thing. Uh, one part of reparation should be utilizing the free enterprise system to its fullest extent. We have to start incorporating ourselves in the free enterprise system and, and capitalism in the best way we know how. So we're going to do so by showing my book, The African American Guide to Better English. Is That's my brother's book. See, I love you, Gerard. My book is How to Find a Good Black Man. It's available on Amazon.com and it's also on our website. It's a book that I wrote to try to let women know a little bit about the male psyche, how to find a good black man. Look for us to come to a, uh, we're going to have a grand opening for this book at coffee shops in your area. That sounds good. Well, since you're going to give a shout out for your capitalistic venture, I'm going to give one out for my educational venture. I want you guys to go and check me out. It's www.drrachel.com. Now, it's spelled a little differently than traditional Rachel. It's spelled D-R-R-A-C-H-A-E-L. That's www.drrachel.com. It's an online sexual health guide. So send all of the young ladies and the young men who are out there having sex or are about to who just need a few answers to things, need to know what they're getting themselves into because they might check the site out and change their mind. So. Your name is spelled unconventional because you're unconventional. <laughs> And folks, I'm going to take that as a compliment. It's an absolute compliment okay. because you're, n you're not a cookie cutter person over here. They okay. threw away the mold when they made Dr. Rachel Ross. Okay. Believe me, Rachel's in the house. Thank now, you. we're going to jump into this issue. We don't know where this discussion is going to go. It's no telling, right. okay? Because it's very controversial. There are many, many people opposed to the, the concept of of rewarding or, or I'm sorry trying to repair the the injustice and the cruelty of slavery in America um, people think that it's a bygone thing that we shouldn't concern ourselves with it so much we should just move on from where we are and forget about slavery and and, and don't have sour grapes and look at all the other races of people who have overcome great obstacles and that whole line of thinking however when you look beyond the surface and look deeper into this, this reparations issue, you, 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 still must, you still must take into account the damage that was done. Uh, we had a show about hating, what we call hating, uh, the way black people have a great amount of self-hatred, and a lot of hatred comes from outside as well. These things didn't come, they weren't invented in a vacuum. They didn't just happen. Right. There is a reason for them happening. And in, in my adult life has shown me that these things harken back to slavery. It actually goes back to a time when, when we were treated as less than a human being. Uh, it's actually in the Constitution of us being three-fifths of a human being, not to be given any rights and privileges. Of course, that's been amended, thank God. However, the fact that that existed means that you're, you're behind the starting line. Or the fact that the country was built on that means um, that you were behind the starting line. Because if you think about it, those were the founding documents of the United States of America. So if you can go back to the founding documents of a country and see that within those documents you were considered to be less than a man, then it only makes sense that what you're building on is putting us at such a level that's so below everybody, how, are you, how do you expect the group to climb back up out of that without an extra little boost? Right, exactly. And to me, it's almost academic. It's, something has to be done. Um, administering it could be a problem, <laughs> okay? And the disbursements of funds or benefits could be a real problem. And, and we'll get into that a, a, in a little later in the discussion. What mm -hmm. I want to handle right now is um, it's not just reparations for slavery. It's also reparations for the aftermath. It's reparations for Jim Crowism, right. okay? The policy, the unwritten policy in America that held black people back. Right. Uh, it's also reparations for segregation, being excluded from the, the greater body, body politic. It's also reparations for redlining in, uh, in real estate, 
and in jobs. It's reparations for discrimination in jobs. And those come a little bit closer to the present day. Correct. Uh, indeed, it was, it was much worse in our parents' day, but we still see its, its vestiges today. But I, I'm going to give one um, that this isn't a lynching or this isn't something that, that, that is sensational, but something that happened to my father was interesting. He was in the Army. And uh, it just so happened that when he was leaving, I think, basic training, going to his other station, they were on a train. And the train happened to pass through Hammond, hmm. okay? So the word to the soldiers was, okay, stop Hammond, Indiana, smoke them if you got them. You know, at that time, my dad was a smoker. He quit many years ago, but he was a smoker when he was a young man. And he said, well, great, and this is my hometown. Let me get out, you know, maybe make a phone call, because they were going to be there for a while. And when he got out of the train, um, his drill sergeant, who happened to be a, 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 a southern white, not that that makes a big difference back in those days, but nonetheless, he basically shooed my dad back into the train and wouldn't let him take his smoke break or make his phone call in his own hometown. Now, that's not a major thing, but those are the type of aggravations that we almost have come to see as commonplace, and especially people in that age group. No, that's right, and I think we've almost forgotten it. You know, you know, you do have to get over things and move through them, but I saw a great commercial the other day for the Martin Luther King um, Jr. Foundation in Atlanta, and it uses Halle Berry. Halle Berry walks into this bar, like a, a restaurant setting, and there's all these white people around. And she walks, she has to go past, they, they, the camera shoots her going past all these people to all the way to the back. And Halle Berry sits down and she says that if segregation still existed like it did just a few years ago, she would have to continuously go to the back to sit down and have her food. And it was a very powerful message yeah. because when you can take it to young people and people who just kind of like, well, everything's fine, we're all gray, we're all happy, blacks are just doing are just as well as white people, right. Then you hear, see this person, Halle Berry, the first uh, black woman person to ever win an Emmy, you know, to, to, she's telling you, she's saying, you know, without the civil rights movement, I still wouldn't even be here right now. Exactly. And it's a, that's a powerful statement. It's very powerful. And it has to be packaged in a way that people can say, oh gosh, Halle Berry? Right. Isn't she gray? Isn't her mom white or something? Why, why would she have to sit in the back? Well, if you had any ounce of black blood in you, you'd have to go to the back, so. Indeed, absolutely. In fact, in fact, she would have probably even been treated worse having been mixed. Exactly. In many cases. Indeed. Now, let's talk about the administration of, of reparations should have come down the pike for African Americans. First of all, I had this discussion with my uncle uh, the other day. Incidentally, we went out to the Amistad, mm -hmm. uh, the, the boat oh, that it was great. Yeah, yeah, it had the, the, there was a slave revolt on the, um, the Amistad ship. And basically, these, to make a long story short, the, in, the, the occupants of that ship basically sued the government and won their freedom. Uh, from the Amistad. It was out at the, the Hammond Marina. The Hammond Marina, and, that's right. Uh, so it was very informative. I happened to see my uncle out there. It was unplanned and he just was there. And so we got together and we ended up having dinner. And he's a genealogist, mm -hmm. okay? And his thing is, he's so nervous about how we get ripped off a lot that he He's falling in for the thing that says you have to absolutely be able to prove that you're a descendant of slaves. Now, and it's, 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 it's a valid thing he's doing, and it has merit. So, Uncle Bill, it's all good. But the overwhelming majority of black people in America are have slave, are descendants of slaves. Right. You know, it's only if you're from the Caribbean or from Europe or something. And if you're from the Caribbean, you're surely a descendant of slaves. You just were slaves over in the Caribbean. You see, so to me, that's right. kind of a trick that makes you say, well, how are you related? We can actually trace ours, because he's a right. genealogist. He, he did it, OK? Right. But the, oh, most of us are descendants of slaves. Yeah. You, you know, you had some Moors and some free people who did come over here and mm. set up different colonies, but the vast majority of us didn't, co didn't, didn't come through that. Right. If you have roots in the South, I mean, you pretty much know that your ancestors were slaves. Exactly, exactly. So, so it becomes a, a, a moot point, and it's kind of a diversion 
when people say, well, if that happens, you're going to have to prove it. You know, that's, that's a trick in and of itself, I think. Maybe what they should do is put a meter on you, and if you walk into Marshall Fields and people follow you around the store... Bingo! Reparation. Then you're black. <laughs> See, that's why you're on the show. Exactly. Because what she's referring to there is we get followed through stores, even when we have a little bit of money. I mean, you know, even if do you get, do, Come on now, out. Rachel L. Ross, MD, DJ, Renaissance woman, artist, poet, you get followed through stores? Oh, come on now. Of course I do. Especially considering the fact that, you know, I take on many different personas, especially if I have on jeans and a, and a throwback or some gym shoes or something like that. Oh, my goodness. I'm a great target. Mm -hmm. so. so it's like, th this is good because it's a small instance, but it's an instance nonetheless. What, 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 what kind of reparation should we get for even that? You know what I'm saying? It should be, it should be to the point where maybe now you get a, you get a, a cheerful greeting or something, mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or people, maybe if they don't know who you are, maybe you should come and say, you know, this is who I am, and maybe they, you know, they have tea with you or something, so that the next time you come in the store, I see. you won't be hassled. You know, I kind of embrace it because I would always like to be very much in touch with what's really going on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you ever get to the point where someone's treating you completely different than the rest of your people, then you don't really ever know what's really going on. So, I mean, I, I embrace it for what it is. So, in, in, a, in a way, it makes you down with the struggle, as they I say. I guess so. You're in the trenches. I guess so. That's right it. in the trenches. That is very interesting. Uh, if we're going to talk when we come on the other side of the break, we're going to talk about actual disbursements of, of funds. You know, this is totally speculative. No one really knows, but it's going to come down one day. It may, maybe not in our lifetime, but maybe one day it'll come down to it, uh, and, and it'll be interesting to see how it's how it's dispersed and distributed, and maybe you and I can come up with some ideas you know, on the next half about that. Well, you know what? If we continue at the rate we're going with HIV in prison. There may not be anyone left to pay. No takers. No takers. Oh my God, that's, that's one in ten black men have HIV. What in two in ten are in prison. So by the end of it, there might not be anyone left to really yoke. So if you come up with a law and say if you've ever been convicted of a crime, forget about it. You don't get any money. So if you look at it like that, maybe there won't be anyone here to get any. Wow, indeed, and that might be a holdover from slavery in and of itself. It's it's, it's sounding very diabolical. <laughs> Oh my God, no takers in the year 2055 or something. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> my God, I'll see how scared I am at this thing. Wow. I'll tell you what, we're going to take a break right now and come back and talk about the administration and the disbursements of reparations funds. Thank you. Welcome back to The Big Picture. I'm Theodore McClendon from McClendonReport.com. Theo the Thinker. I'm here with Dr. Rachel Ross, and we're talking about reparations for slavery for African Americans, and it's a uh, hot and heavy discussion, uh, something that uh, needs to be talked about more, I think. What do you yeah. think? Yeah, oh, I definitely Yes, think so. indeed. People are afraid of the issue. It's like if you notice, a lot of people are afraid to say that they think, a lot of, a lot of black people are afraid to say that they think that some reparations should be made. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that a lot. Where does the you, fear come from on both sides? Tell me. Well, you know, it's interesting because we have just as much opposition coming from our own people as from other people. So when um, you see people on television, you know, that look just like you and they're like, no, what do we need reparations for? We're on the up and up. It really makes you think, now here you are. Why don't you just stay at home and not even talk about it then? If you're going to get on national TV, you know, you're the president of some foundation and you're sitting up there, we don't need reparations. Everything is great. You know, mm -hmm. what, what type of message is that really sending out? Because what you're saying is that what happened to us really isn't that bad. I mean, you know, because I'm not trying to get reparations so that I can get a new car or so that I can get a bigger house or anything. I think that we need reparations so we can get the school system in place. Indeed. So that we can take the people, you know, because 20% of us, I would say we represent maybe 20% of our people. Okay. And then there's another 80% out there that are really struggling. If you compare 20% with 80%, that's just ridiculous. Yes. And so for our 20%, for 90% of our little group of people who mm. are educated and, you know, doing fine and well, to sit back and say, well, we don't need any reparations. We're doing just fine. That's ignoring the 80% of us that are not doing just fine. It really is. And, and I admire you for that, for speaking up like that. You know, education would be key here. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's a great book 
and I'm sure you're aware of it. I must have had three or four copies I mentioned to you. It's one of those books that if you loan it, you'll never see it again. It's called <laughs> The Miseducation of the Negro. Black people, first of all, it's written by Carter G. Woodson. Okay, it's written right around the turn of the century, I believe. This individual was able to really focus in on some of our pathologies as far as the way we think. Mm -hmm. And it's almost frightening how modern that book reads even today about the mentalities that black people have. He says we're miseducated. We're, we're, it's not that we haven't gone to school, but we haven't learned the things we need to learn to be functional citizens, mm -hmm. okay? And certainly we haven't learned the things we need to know to, to be participants in, in free enterprise to the betterment of ourselves and our families. Mm -hmm. And his book speaks to that poignantly. Uh, so when we talk education, um, if, if reparations would ever come down the pike, I would be strongly suggest that that book be in every black person and white person's home in America. Mm -hmm. You see, right. that's not a dollar amount. That's just something that needs to be done so we can start to understand a little bit why we're going awry in different areas. Right. But still on the line of education, even if money were dispersed, you know, I heard the figure $20,000, I heard the figure $250,000, anywhere within those parameters, that still would be no good if there, wasn't, if there weren't an education component. I joked off the set, and I joke a lot with my brothers that it would, if, if there's no educational component, we would draw a beeline to the car dealers, to the clothing stores, and, and to the place where they sell rims that turn in opposite directions. Spinners. 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 We we have so many of those things. We, you know, it would be it would be totally dysfunctional. We would be the laughing stock, not only of America of the world. So there would have to be some kind of educational component to help us incorporate these reparations. What, what do you say about that? Well, I think, it, I think we have to sit back and say that there is no dollar amount that can amount to taking a group of people from where they originally were, uprooting them, bringing them somewhere new, and completely killing every social ideology that they ever had, and stripping them to the bare minimum, you know, stripping them of all their religion, stripping them of all their values, and then throwing them out there and just being like, okay, well, go, go be whoever you want. So we're basically a group of people that we don't, you know, we're kind of lost. We don't know what direction indeed, to go. Indeed, indeed, lost. Lost. Yes. So there's no dollar amount that could really come on that. And so I think people get caught up in trying to act like we're just trying to get some money here. Mm -hmm. And what we're really trying to do is get some help for a situation that's really gotten out of control. So I do not think that we would ever effectively be able to just give out money to, to anybody, because first of all, no one would ever okay, okay that. <laughs> okay, okay. totally impractical like, right. and improbable. Right, okay. that we ever get any money for it, but you know, probably what may end up happening is they might set up some programs or some institutions where the money will go to, and then they're supposed to set up these massive programs. Um, I'm not 100% sure that that will work either. Mm -hmm. You know, you give a program money, the program has a program director that really decides where that money goes. True. So, Speaking of program, I'll uh -huh. stop you in mid sentence sure. and we're going to begin the series that you're going to end up starting anyway right. because you are that forthright and you're going to make it happen. Mm -hmm. When we speak of programs, a lot of people go on talk shows saying there ought to be a program. There should be this, there should be that, and programs will be instituted. Let me know the kind of program Dr. Rachel Ross would institute regarding the issue of uh, educating people in, in, in sexual health. What well, would you do? Because I imagine that would have to be a component. Oh, that would definitely have to be a component. Because really, sexual health, health in general, obesity, all of the things that plague a group of people and keep them, quote, unhealthy, whether it's sexually, socially, mentally, is completely based, in my opinion, on your, yourself and on your self-esteem. And so if you don't really have strong self-esteem, and I talk about it all the time, I don't think we've had a show where I haven't mentioned self-esteem, that you really have to institute programs that are designed to get the self-esteem up. Mm -hmm. So you can really educate people. You you, know, do you feel blacks have the lowest self-esteem of any particular group in America? Well, you know, I don't want to say it's the lowest because I'm not a part of any other group. And, you know, I, 
I, I think. But in your observation, I mean, because you, okay, you mentioned that you say it almost on every show, yeah. and when we talk, you speak about the lack of self-esteem. Right. So what has, you know, why does that, uh, why, why is that included in so much of your conversation? Well, because we were designed to have poor lack, poor self-esteem. Uh. And I think that there's a bit of a difference. You know, Latinos might have poor self-esteem based off of something that's happened or based off of their upbringing. And, you know, J Jewish people might, you know, everybody's got their Low reasons, but ours was designed by that design. Way. That was that's designed. There were books and volumes written on how to break up the black family, how to break your Negro, how to make it so that they have no self-esteem and will obey everything that you say. So if you come from an ancestral line where that was ritualistically ingrained into their brain, there, it only makes sense that you're trying to climb out of that. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and we're not doing a good job of it right now because those of us who are able to overcome poor self-esteem and you know, work through it and become you know, functioning citizens, we're not really reaching back to, to help the other ones kind of come up to, to par on it. So, you know, we've kind of gotten to the point where we think, okay, well, we're all black, but the struggle is over. You know, you're black on your terms and I'm black on my terms. I'm black and I go to work every day and you're black and you're on welfare. So you handle that and I'm going to handle this and, you know, and everybody's turning a blind eye to what's really going on. But at some point we have to sit back and say, well, I mean, yeah, this is another black person, and we're all related. We're all cousins, and we really all went through the same struggle. It was not that long ago that we weren't sitting at that kitchen, at that, at that diner table. We were sitting at the back of the bus. So our struggle, you know, you hear the elders talking about, well, you know, you can't focus on that right now. But somebody's got to focus on it, or else we're just all headed right, right down to the tubes. True. So all of our programs need to be focused centrally on raising self-esteem. Self that could, that's almost a catch-all, and, and, and you might be onto something here, hmm. because if self-esteem is the main theme, self-esteem is the main theme, then everything else will come into place using that as like a, a, a beacon. Yes. You know, there will be greater uh, sexual health. There will be exactly. greater. Uh, regard for one's fellow man. Exactly, because if you think about it, we all know people who are just as educated as ourselves who are not sexually healthy, who are not mentally healthy, and who are not physically healthy. They have access to that information. They've read it. They know it. They can even recite it to you, but they're not healthy. So you look at it and you say, well, why? They have the information. They are educated. It's because their self-esteem is poor. They're not focused on their inner self and how beautiful they are on the inside and the outside. They're just focused on poor self-esteem. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just sitting here thinking, Theo the thinker, I'm thinking very deeply about self-esteem should be the mainstay of any program. That's why there's such a big effort to put terrible images that young people wa watch and listen to. Like because what? Because you realize if, you're, if kids are listening to that every morning, my coochie's great, my hoochie's this, my blah, 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 they're going to be losers. <laughs> I yes. mean, because it's, they're, they're just hearing it over and over in their brain, and they're looking in the mirror, and they're like, my coochie's great. You know, right. why, why should you be singing that when you're nine? Why should you be dancing to that when you're nine? Right. So if you think about it, self-esteem is the way to get a group of people moving forward, and it's also a good way to keep a group of people from not moving forward. And that's what we're seeing here, is that we are stuck because all we were doing is watching videos, music videos, dancing to them and singing, singing to them on the radio. I mean, you know I love music. Absolutely. But, but geez, I was at the nail salon the other day and a five-year-old boy was singing, I'm a pimp. You know, I'm yeah. like, why should you be five and even know what a pimp is? Yeah, when I go places, when I go to my kids' schools and stuff, I might be dressed up, and might be wearing a suit or wearing some decent clothes. Some of those little boys, what's up, pimp? Yeah. You know, and every now and then I stop and say, that's not necessarily a positive term, young man. Yeah. You see? But you're on to something here. Mm hmm this, You know, right here on the set, I'm finding out, you know, where our collaboration is going to take place. Like, right. we all know that 
there, we're going to develop a cartoon for the Dr. Rachel character, right. and her main thing is self-esteem. That's right. You know, she's going to shoot you with a dose of self-esteem. Yeah. Boom! All of a sudden, ah, oh, I feel better about myself. Right. And and the music that you're going to be creating, and it's going to deal with self-esteem without being corny or without being overly didactic. It's still going to do this, and and I'm seeing where your niche is going to be here. Yeah, definitely. Because the only way you can ever feel like you can fly is if you see somebody who's flying. Because if you don't ever really see anybody who possesses those flying capabilities, you know, sometimes you look at someone on TV or you know somebody who's like, oh, that person could do anything, and I'm going to be just like that person, and I can do anything. If you don't ever see that or feel that, you are just... And you're, you're just a blob sitting there. See, you, you're becoming a superhero as we speak <laughs> because this discussion was on reparations from slavery. And then we bounce to self-esteem. Because that's what that we the, need to repair. Yes, we need to repair our self-esteem mm -hmm. more than anything else. More than anything because else. from that can come greater business, greater health. Exactly. A greater, more holistic life exactly. from having more self-esteem. Exactly. You're on to something, lady. <laughs> Look at you. Well, if you repair the self-esteem, you don't have to repair anything else because it'll take care of itself. So if you think about the times when our parents were little and the community was actually trying to have self-esteem. I mean, we had our own grocery stores, right. we had our own doctors, our own lawyers. You know, we were very self-sufficient. And, you know, we just got so far away from that. Right. That Right. Some of it was uh, terrorism from, from hate groups, but others was just an implosion from within. Yeah, exactly. And a reverting back to uh, the dog-eat-dog, um, uh, house Negro, field Negro mentality of, of divide and conquer. Welfare. Just give it to me and I'll sit back and take it. Indeed. You know? We're, we're going to revisit this issue, but see, what I found is the big picture. Mm -hmm. Gerard, I'm sorry, we should have been saying that all along. We had the big picture the big moment picture. today. The big picture moment is the true reparations would be to give us our self-esteem back and to help us bolster self-esteem so that we will love ourselves enough to do for self. That's right. That's right. You couldn't buddy. have said that better. That's my you buddy right have said there. That <laughs> and thank you, Dr. Rachel. Any closing comments real quick here? Uh, cl in closing, seconds. reparations, repair. It is the root of reparations. Repair our self-esteem. That's where the programs need to be. Right on, Dr. Sorry. Ross. We're going to have her back on real soon. Thanks for joining us on The Big Picture. We talked about reparations. I'm Theo McClendon, Theo the Thinker, McClendonReport.com. We'll see you next time.